Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 19th, 2018, and before introducing today's guest, I want to mention I'm planning to do at least two Econ Talk episodes in early September on the book In the First Circle by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So feel free to read that in advance and follow along if you'd like. I haven't decided whether those are going to be regular Econ Talk episodes or bonus Econ Talk episodes. Uh, but if you want to be prepared for those by having read the book, uh, now would be a good time. It is a 741 page read. Uh, so be aware of what you're getting into. I announced this on Twitter yesterday, and Amazon is now sold out of the paperback. Uh, the Kindle is still – the Kindle version, of course, is still available. Uh, but I recommend the paperback. There's a lot of characters, and even though there's a list of characters and you can highlight them on the Kindle, I think a paperback is easier. I read it on the Kindle and found it uh, somewhat challenging. I also want to mention there are two versions of the book. The original version is The First Circle. You want to get in The First Circle. Uh, so Jensen self-censored the first one to get it published, and we'll be discussing the fuller one called In The First Circle. And now for today's guest, Teppo Feline. Teppo is a professor of strategy at Said Business School, University of Oxford. His areas of expertise include strategy, entrepreneurship, and innovation, complex systems, and competitive advantage. Tapo, welcome to EconTalk. Thanks for having me. Our topic for today is an essay you wrote, The Fallacy of Obviousness, which you published at eon.com. We'll put a link up to that, of course. And before we get to that essay and some of the academic work that's behind it that you've done, I want to encourage listeners to watch a YouTube video that's called Selective Attention Test. You can find that video at econtalk.org at the page for this episode under the heading Delve Deeper, where you can find things related to our conversation. Or you can just Google Selective Attention Test. It should be the first video that comes up. It is a minute and 22 seconds. So if you're not driving, I encourage you to pause this conversation, watch the video, and you'll get a lot more and enjoy this conversation more if you uh, do that in advance, and you will potentially avoid a spoiler. So I'm going to count to five to give you a chance to pause and watch before we start talking about it. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. You're back. We're back. So, Tepo, this video, which now has about 19 million views, was created by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabris, two psychologists. And what – it tells – describe the video and tell us what conclusions uh, Simons and Chabris draw from it and what other people have said about it. So uh, in the video uh – as you mentioned, you're asked to sort of watch something. It's called a selective attention test. And in the video, uh, in the first screen, those of your listeners who did it, the test, it asks you to count the number of basketball um, passes made uh, by the team wearing black, I think, I, I believe. And in the video, what you see is two teams, one wearing white shirts, one wearing black shirts, passing a basketball. And essentially, it turns out to be a relatively sort of attention-heavy uh, task. Uh, and so you're trying to count these basketball passes. I actually just did this with my father-in-law uh, um, um, when he came to visit in Oxford last week. And sure enough, he managed to count the right number of basketball passes by uh, made by this team uh, wearing uh, 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 black jerseys. And, and in, in, the, in the clip, you have uh, three, uh, two, two teams, like I said, and, and, and a total of sort of uh, six players. Players, uh, three on each team, and, and so they're both passing that, basketballs around, right? So you have to kind exactly. of focus carefully yeah, on the team wearing really, the right color. Focus. And, exactly. Yep. And so my father-in-law turned to me and he said, "He said, Teppo, I nailed it. I got it exactly right. It's 21 passes." And so I asked him, "I said, you know, did you see the gorilla?" And he, he just stares at me. And, and now I've done this exercise with students in, in years past as well. And it turns out that sort of some proportion of people, uh, uh, they've run different conditions in terms of which you know team you're paying attention to, how fast the gorilla, whether it stops in the middle and so forth. But it's sort of some range between you know, 20, 30 to 70, 80 percent of people miss the gorilla, essentially. And, and um, the, the inference that, uh, that uh, Christopher Shabris and, and Daniel Simons draw from this is that um, uh, uh, people are um, 
what well, they call it inattentional uh, blindness. And so the argument is that because we're paying attention to something else, we miss things that are also happening in the screen that you'd think we would catch somehow. But it turns out that we don't see the gorilla. And like I said, it sort of surprises most of us. And I guess the uh, the, the interpretation that, that or reinterpretation that I try to sort of highlight in the Eon essay is that this, you know, this, we could look at this test in a couple different ways. One is that you know people are blind, and and I actually sort of in the in the essay anchor a little bit on Kahneman's interpretation of this exact experiment. So in his book Thinking Fast and Slow, he says, you know, this tells us two fundamental things about the mind, namely that you know humans can be blind to the obvious, and we're we're sort of oblivious to this blindness essentially. Tapo, um, before you go yeah. on, we should make it clear for those of you who did not watch the video. Uh, it's, there's nothing subtle about the gorilla. It's not like he just sort of jumps on the screen for a second and disappears. He wanders around. He's, he's, it's a human being in a gorilla suit, and he's, yes. when, you, when you watch it the second time, he's blindingly obvious. He's Absolutely. very, very <laughs> present. It's not like a trick. It's, it, it, well, yeah. there's a trick, but it's not the trick that, that you might yeah. think if, you, if you're hearing this described for the first time. It's right. shocking that anyone misses the gorilla. And, and Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So and so the question is sort of what's what's the interpretation of that? And 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 you can sort of read uh, the Shabris and Simon's interpretation. So this was published in the journal Perception. In fact, it's the high, most highly cited piece in their journal. And their sort of interpretations waffles a little bit between sort of saying, okay, humans are blind, or it's just an example of focus. But if you look at what they're sort of emphasizing and actually measuring, is it's the fact that you know many people miss the gorilla. That's sort of the surprise. And like I said, that's sort of been taken to and interpreted in different ways. And in, for, for me, it sort of it sort of highlights sort of a certain ethos or zeitgeist around what we're looking for in terms of, you know, uh, human nature. And, and particularly the interpretation that Kahneman emphasizes that becomes quite important throughout his book. And for me, more broadly in behavioral economics is that there's this sort of, um, you know, humans are blind, blind to the obvious that are that, that we miss some really fundamental things in our in our visual in our visual um, um, scenes. And this has been taken by others like St Stephen Levitt and others as sort of kind of a culminating summary of, of, of what it is that behavioral economics is after as well. And I, I guess, um, you know, uh, my, my sort of challenge to that is that it's, it's a little bit of a Rorschach test in terms of uh, what we can say with that data. So I don't, I don't have an issue, issues, any issues with the finding itself. So we could sort of all uh, kind of the reproducibility efforts or, uh, 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 you know, go and replicate this finding. And I think that any number of people, just like my father-in-law, would, would also miss the gorilla. The question is, what precisely is it telling us about perception, about awareness, and I think more fundamentally about human nature. And I guess that's what's most important to me because this, this sort of guerrilla study has been a sort of a big jumping off point for, for the authors themselves, Shabriz and, and Simons. They wrote a book called uh, Invisible Gorilla and Other Ways Our Intuitions Deceive Us. And so there's a strong emphasis on sort of humans being blind, uh, uh, susceptible to illusion, and so forth. And, and, and my challenge would be that that the, the essentially illustrates something different, slightly more mundane in some ways, but I actually think quite powerful and important. And it's, it's sort of that angle that I think is important and that I try to sort of push in that essay and then in the associated sort of academic pieces that we also published. And I, I want to say, I, I, on the surface, this topic, uh, the uh, of the gorilla and our blindness to the obvious or some other interpretation it seems like kind of a kind of a narrow um, a narrow thing to have an econ talk episode about but I actually think it's quite deep and I hope in the course of our conversation that we can tease out some of the implications of your interpretation of this very specific social science experiment to lead to some implications for economics writ large and how we think about data and how we understand the world. And when you say human nature, I really think of it as more broader than that, even that's like that's not broad enough. But it, <laughs> it's really I think your insight into this, which we're going to get to right now, your insight is that it, it tells us a lot about just the whole enterprise of being human and trying to understand the world in its complexity. So you you in giving an alternative interpretation, talk about the fallacy of obviousness. 
What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I, I think sort of fallacy, or so so obviousness is 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 a little bit of a a trap. So I think that many things are sort of obvious in retrospect, but uh, uh, obviousness is is never sort of a priori evident unless we're looking for something specific, right? And and so I guess the the the, the issue that I have with the test and, and and something that it sort of highlights more broadly in terms of like you said human nature and other issues that we'll talk about is that uh, uh, my concern is that the interpretation that humans miss the obvious isn't the right one. Rather, the right one is that uh, people respond to questions. So we attend to our visual scenes with questions in mind, and then we focus our attention. And that's partly what Sh uh, Shabris and, and Simon say in their argument. But then if you look at the subsequent emphasis in terms of what Kahneman says and, and, and in terms of where behavioral economics has sort of taken this ethos, the emphasis is largely on biases and mistakes and sort of isn't it funny? Failure. Uh, hum yeah, failure. And, 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 and like I said, it's sort of led to other directions that I talk about in the Ian essay, which is sort of, you know, denigrating human nature more generally and saying, well, we'll, we'll solve these problems with artificial intelligence and, and nudges and, you know, other types of things. And, and, and like I said, the, the more powerful point to me, which isn't the emphasis of the article is, is that, you know, there's a set of questions whenever we're attending to visual scenes that direct our, our aware, our, our awareness. And so when I'm looking for my keys, so I tend to frequently lose my, you know, cell phone and my keys, I have sort of a, an image in my head in terms of what I'm looking for. And I'll miss any number of other things as I'm scanning uh, until I find sort of the answer in the same way that, you know, subjects who are doing this test, they'll, att they'll attune themselves to basketball passes, but they'll miss any number of obvious things. And so in the Art Aeon article, I talk about, you know, in that clip, there's many obvious things. There's uh, obvious, obvious. Uh, 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 there's, there's, um, for example, the gender composition of the teams passing the basketball, or what color hair they have, or what color the carpet is. Or it ends up that actually in the background, there's two letters spray painted. And so I could ask people afterwards and say, what were the two letters that were spray painted? They're very obvious in the clip, right? But I, I would miss them because I'm paying attention based on cues, primes, prompts, questions problems that I have that then direct my awareness to certain things in any visual scene. And, 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 and so it's, it's, it's sort of emphasizing that, um, uh, that powerful, uh, uh, uh uh, focus and awareness that we have based on what's in our mind, essentially. And Shabriz and Simons would sort of, I think, highlight that. But like I said, the emphasis is on the blindness, and that's what they measure is how many people miss the gorilla, not how many people attended to X, whatever it might be in the, you know, in the visual scene that we're looking at. And I, I think it's really a deep insight into the nature of reality, which is, again, why I think it's, a, it's larger even than human nature. You know, reality is really yeah. complicated, um, and our brains – relentlessly do two things that are contradictory. They fill in stuff that that we might not be saying because we're right. going to make it uh, uh, easier to interpret that complexity. So my favorite example of this, I'm driving to school. My son's on his way. I'm driving with my wife to my summer work here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And my son is riding a bicycle. Uh, he doesn't want to drive. He wants to ride his bike. And he's going to arrive roughly the same time for his first day of work on campus. Yeah. And I'm worried he's going to be late. And he's a teenager. He's never had a, much of a job before. It's right. a couple years ago. And he's going the other direction. I, as we pull up, I see him bicycling <laughs> away from where his interview is. And one of the things I'm worried about, of course, is that he's, this is his first day. He's not going to work, know where to go. And I I jump out of the car. I got to where I needed to get out, and I yelled his name. <laughs> and to my horror, he didn't respond. Right. So I yelled it even louder. And then I was puzzled and disturbed because he was wearing <laughs> uh, clearly a backpack that wasn't his. <laughs> and, of course, that's because it wasn't him. It was somebody who looked vaguely like him. My mind filled in and told a story that said, right. my son's going the wrong way. Ridiculous. <laughs> uh, absolutely Ridiculous. My wife actually saw him later that day. The same guy he actually looked a lot like my son, which <laughs> sure. helped make the story work. But yeah. my mind told a ridiculous story, filled in details, made it him when it wasn't him. Right. At the same time, I will tune out a thousand things uh, right. that I see every day in my house to ease, not consciously, to ease my perception of the world. And you know, I, I always like to point out, if you put a bunch of things on your wall because you think they're beautiful – 
your guests will enjoy them because they will notice them. After a week, a month, a year, five years, ten years, you won't enjoy the artwork in your house so much because right. your brain yeah. won't see it. Just tunes yep. it out. Right. And I've used this example before, you know, government warnings on cigarette packages, uh, bottles of alcohol for pregnant women, driving machinery. You know, the first time you see it, it's like, whoa. The 50th time, <laughs> you literally don't see it. And that's part of what right. I think that's really yep. interesting and important, but it doesn't mean we're blind. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess part part of the fallacy of obviousness for, obviousness for me is precisely about the nature of reality. And so there's a sense in which obviousness is sort of given by reality itself, right? So real, reality itself has certain characteristics and in terms of size or color and so forth. And this is actually a tradition that Kahneman comes from. So he was trained in an area called psychophysics in the 60s, which was an area that sort of tried to map environmental stimuli onto the mind. And, and in, his, in his Nobel speech, he sort of talks about these, what he calls natural assessments, which is sort of size, loudness, you know, essentially the world tells us what's, what's obvious. And so if you take this into the gorilla clip, you'd say, how would anybody miss this massive moving thing going across? That's very surprising uh, because it should be it should be obviously a thing that we recognize, that we pay attention to and so forth. And so it comes from this notion that reality sort of gives us what's relevant and meaningful or obvious. And the argument of the essay is that there's nothing, there's, there's nothing like obviousness. <laughs> obviousness is a function of what's in our mind, the questions that we have, the problems that we have, and how we sort of attune to the world. And so it's sort of trying to flip the importance of uh, uh, rather than looking at nature out there, looking at the organism, looking at nature and the questions that it has. And, and there's actually some really interesting sort of biological uh, insights, for, insights from biology that sort of also, uh, you know, verify uh, this, this as well. So well, I was struck by the parallel to the episode, Econ Talk episode with Ian McGilchrist, where he talks about two different ways of thinking. The left side of the brain is very focused on a task. Yeah. Like he gives the example of a bird trying to separate a piece of grain from the dirt and a little gravel maybe around it. Got to really pay attention to the, to that little piece of grain. Right. And he's going to be oblivious potentially to a predator. So with right. the right side of his brain, he's kind of looking around all the time. And you can see animals do this. You can see animals, especially birds, because they're very uh, prone, I guess, to being eaten. Uh, they're <laughs> constantly on alert. They can they they look very stressed out all the time right. and they're constantly and, and animals feeding will often do this as well other you know four-legged animals do this when they feed they don't just chow down they chow down nervously they're always trying to scan the horizon for a gorilla <laughs> for a predator something, <laughs> something large sure. and obvious and we do alternate i think as human beings between these two modes, the more focused mode, the more integrated, take in the whole scene. How do I fit in what McGilchrist calls, calls connectedness or betweenness, my relationship to all kinds of things around me? And those – reality isn't one of those things or the other. It's both of those things, right? It's, right. it's – the world's basically the – other, you know, the other thought I had is the world's full of data, lots yeah. of data. And yeah. there's, no, there's no sense in which, oh, that data is important and this isn't. I don't know what those – which falls into which category in advance, ex ante. If you tell yeah. me, look for the gorilla, I won't miss it. You tell me, right. when does the gorilla come on screen? I'm not going to – I'm not going to be blind to the obvious. I'll get it, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it all depends I, on what my task is, what my exactly. – what what's important. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess uh, that's an issue that I sort of re reflect on in the essay as well is that there's this sense that, yeah, the world will tell us what's obvious and, and, the, and the whole sort of – all the attention on things like big data and so forth seem to sort of reinforce this idea that, you know, data will tell us the truth. But for, from my perspective, you know, data is only as good as the questions and the theories that we have of it, essentially. And so so it's not the amount of data, rather that it's it's the questions that we ask of it. And so I, I have a co-author that's here at the Alan Turing Institute, and they just ran, run these mega, mega data sets. And you can run all kinds of correlations and, and you know, and so forth. But, but you, you know, you don't get anything out of it until you have some kind of informed guess and theory about what types of relationships we might 
you know, expect. And, and so that's why, um, um, for example, there was this wired piece that sort of talked about the end of, end of theory, how the deluge of yeah. big data will sort of, you know, replace science or something like that. And I, I just find that to be a, the biggest uh, sort of misnomer. I, I, I think that, you know, theory and problems and questions are more and more important in, in this environment because data never sort of has some kind of meaning or relevance attached to it. It's only useful in answering questions and, 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 and in the same way as, as, uh, as that gorilla clip sort of illustrates. And so, yeah, I, I've mentioned this story before, but I have, I have, uh, I've heard m- a number of young economists, and, and I don't mean literally young, but just tr- trained a lot more recently than I than I was, say that you know we don't need theory, we just mm-hmm. listen to the data. And I always want to say the data doesn't speak; the data is silent. Right. The only way you get the data to talk is to have a way to think about it, a perspective, a lens, a theory. Right. Right. Um, and I got a quote. I had a uh, Sam Thompson, who's a, a commenter on a, something I wrote a long time ago, said something very profound, which I always like to quote. Uh, the universe is full of dots. Connect the right ones and you can draw anything. The important <laughs> question is not whether the dots you picked are really there, but why you chose to ignore all the others. And right. uh, you know, those correlations in big data, there's, there's, an, there's zillions. <laughs> right, <laughs> you right. got to decide which ones are meaningful, which ones are replicable, which ones are causal. That's what matters yeah. for human affairs, not patterns in the data. Big data is exactly. really good. AI and machine yeah. learning is really good at finding patterns. Yeah. So and I, I guess another even issue, better than I am. Yeah. I'm really good at it <laughs> as a human being. That's one of my weaknesses, right? So AI yeah, is yeah. even better. But yeah, that's yeah. not a that's not a selling point. That's that just means it's got a bigger flaw than I have. Right, right. Yeah, I guess uh the other issue is that I, I don't think that more data in some situations will even sort of tell us sort of the truth, right? So if we if we had more data on this gorilla experiment, I, I, I you know I think this is you know so there's the sort of re- reproducibility and replication crisis. I think that what what's there is a crisis of sort of interpretation and theory in terms of what are, what are the types of questions that we're asking, and if we have this sort of a priori. Uh, focus and fetish with sort of looking for, um, you know, bias and blindness and boundedness, then we'll probably find some uh, against some sort of all-seeing standard. But I think that what's remarkable is, is, is human nature in terms of what is accomplished. And if you look at, you know, I study innovation and creativity and things like that, and, and it, it's hard to sort of argue with the, with the data in the sense of, you know, the, the world that we live in currently and the amazing conveniences and, and things that we have around us that have been accomplished despite the fact that we miss, you know, the occasional gorilla or, or, or what have you. And so, so I think that there's sort of a crisis of interpretation that I'm sort of trying to channel a little bit in that essay and, and, and sort of the associated academic pieces in terms of, of, of uh, what are the questions that we're asking and maybe these a priori sort of this a priori focus on blindness is leading us to sort of craft these um, bias-centric um, outcomes uh, that you know they tell us interesting things, but but I don't know if they tell us something fundamental about again human nature, and and uh, the nature of reality and the ways that we could we could do so. Well, I want to turn to one of those academic papers, uh, which has the title "Rationality Perception and the All Seeing Eye." You published it in the Psychonomic Bulletin Review, and you co-wrote it with uh, Jan Konderink and Joachim Kruger. And in there, you critique Herbert Simon and Kahneman. Uh, both of whom are very uh, dismissive or critical of human rationality, and they're eager, and and much of their careers, or part that they're most famous for, most known for, is their insights into our irrationality. And it, as you point out earlier, it's a, a big part of of the ethos of behavioral economics is to point out our irrationality. And you do point out that there's a certain I would call cheating. <laughs> In, in that, in, in underlying what they assumed. So explain explain what they claimed. Talk about bounded rationality and Con- from a Simon, and what he was trying to do, and, and and Kahneman's twist on that, and then why you think they're missing something. Yeah. So first, I, I wouldn't call it cheating. I, I don't know that this is sort of unethical, deliberately by any means. Like, yeah, it's a bad I, choice I think, of words. I apologize. Yeah, but 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 I but I think that it's it's it's. Um, yeah, but, but I, I guess I have sort of, and, and, and I should recognize Jan and, and, and Joachim on this as well, we have some sort of concerns about, 
where that has taken us essentially. And so, so you know, Herbert Simon essentially is one of the early people to sort of introduce, um, you know, different sort of ideas from psychology into economics. Certainly, Hayek and others, you know, were there uh, as well. But uh, Herbert Simon's first two pieces published uh, in, psych- uh, in in Psychological Review and in uh, Quarterly Journal of Economics in 1955 and 56. Arguably, those sort of were the basis of his um, Nobel Prize, which he got in 1978. And um, it was interesting as I sort of traced the history of this. Um, in those papers, Simon makes the argument that the sort of you know hyper rational, omniscient, rational expectations actor, he says, listen, it's not a real thing. And so what he does is he coins a term which is you know a boundedly rational uh, actor, and and this has turned out to be really influential. So it's it's essential to sort of R. Williamson's transaction cost economics, but it's become really important in artificial intelligence. You know, uh, Herbert Simon was a pioneer in that. They were Williamson and Simon were both at Carnegie Mellon together. And, and, uh, but, but when you go back and read those original ar- ar- articles, it's interesting that the emphasis there is on specifically on perception. So it's the similar foundations to where Kahneman starts in the 60s. And so this is sort of 40s and 50s. And he, he basically says that rather than assume, so imagine an organism sort of that's looking for food. So this is your previous example. And rather than sort of somehow omnisciently seeing all food sources on some kind of landscape and going to the best source, he says, you know, um, animals, organisms are bounded by, you know, some kind of range of vision, what they can see immediately around them. And, and and so he coins this term uh, bounded rationality that's very sort of you know perception centric and perception uh, focused, but it comes from this perspective where uh, 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 the emphasis is on 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 the boundedness that scientists themselves who sit sort of in an all-seeing position specify and say, look, you know, in this environment, you know, humans uh, 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 make these types of mistakes because they can't see everything, but we as scientists can see everything. And, and this is sort of, if you follow the sort of the, the, uh, the breadcrumbs has led to the work that Kahneman did and the subsequent work on nudges and, you know, and other types of things. But the argument that we make is that, you know, the perception, uh, in terms of specifying it as sort of this range that's that's bounded or blind is directed by something else. And that something else is sort of foreshadowed in that essay, but in the work that Jan and, and Joachim and I did, it, there we sort of tried to delineate the actual sort of theoretical arguments which say that, no, we need to look specifically at the organism in terms of what is its uh, the language that sort of works quite well is comes from this ethologist who lived in in the 1930s and 40s, Jakob von Uxkul, who talked about animals, humans as well, having this he calls it a Zuchbild, which is sort of a search or seek image. And so what you have in mind is you're looking for something, and that's that's what's your, well, that's what guides your sort of awareness and attention. In the case of humans, that's those are the questions that we're sort of prompted with, or primed with, or that we have in mind that direct our attention. So, just to give you one example of this from sort of a bio, biological context, if you have a frog that's sitting right in front of a fr- food source, so it's got a cricket right in front of it, but if the cricket doesn't move at all. The, fo- the frog won't recognize it because yep. the frog's Zuchbild or search image is a certain size thing moving at a certain speed. Then it snaps, like then it, then it, then it, then its tongue goes and gets the thing, right? And and so the frog would starve in front of a perfectly good food source uh, unless it moves. And that's sort of the analogy that we try to bring in, which is that, you know, we need to understand the Zuchbild or the theory, the problem question that economic actors have when they're attending to their worlds. And, and the direction that the, the, the sort of the behavioral angle has gone is more focused on the bind, boundedness and the blindness. And we have any number of, there's actually, if you go to the Wikipedia site to look at lists of cognitive biases, it's in the hundreds. I mean, there's just so many of them. And, and, and so there's a lot of emphasis on this. And I guess part of the worries is that's sort of taking up the oxygen in terms of how we think about 
again, human nature and reality, if the emphasis is so strongly on 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 that on that boundedness. And and, and like I said, I, I don't think that there was sort of any cheating involved. I think that there's models in which sort of this bounded rationality is work works and can be useful. But 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 I also think that it's it's now taken us to a place where that emphasis on on the blindness has has uh, uh, we're missing some really fundamental things about human nature, which actually you know some social scientists like Adam Smith and others uh, talked about a long time ago. And so I, I found some sort of really nice insights from those types of places, because I think they give us a better conception of how we think about human actors in their environments, rather than sort of setting up scientists as sort of, you know, these uh, omniscient, all-seeing beings that sort of point out human failure and fab- foibles and so forth. Well, I think it's incredibly important, be- especially this point about omniscience and just that observation. I mean, one of the things I learned from reading your work is to think about that, just that concept that the scientist, the outsider, uh, the policymaker often acts as if they are omniscient. They have all the information, which of course they can't, they don't. Um, So there's sort of two levels to the claim about blindness, right? One is you're you're missing a food source I know about that's better, okay? So you didn't... You're out foraging, you're the animal foraging for food, and you didn't realize that over the hill there's this fantastic stuff, and you you couldn't imagine it even. You didn't even think to imagine it, and so you missed it. And I know, therefore, that you have a suboptimal performance, and I'm going to, therefore, subsidize your climbing of the hill. I'm going to make it cheaper. I'm going to level the hill and allow you to get to the, quote, better food source. And that's better, of course, defined by me. So one level that's strange is that, that, you know, obviously – it may not actually be better. Right. I've decided as the scientist that you've made a suboptimal choice, and we see this in development economics all the time. We see uh, outsiders giving locals advice on what to plant without realizing the complexity. We get there, or they introduce a piece of technology not realizing that it won't be used because it it conflicts with cultural norms of that culture, uh, the, that local culture. Uh, we see it when um, – just, just the way you know, to say that you're flawed, you're imperfect, right. and yet yeah. the scientist claims to know. And it, it, you know, the, the one of the ways this manifests itself that drives me crazy is risk taking. You know, people right. say, "Oh, you're, you're making the wrong choice on some, on some piece of uncertainty," it, neglecting the fact that that a choice that I make that has uncertainty around it can lead me to sleep worse. <laughs> you know, right. that I turn down a risk. Because, oh, but don't you realize the expected value? And I'm thinking, why would you ever <laughs> make that judgment on the behalf of another human being? But people do – we do it as policymakers and as social scientists all the time. So I think this idea of omniscience and, and is important. And you mentioned this. How do you pronounce uh, Jacob or Jacob's – how do you pronounce his name? It's Uxkul. Uxkul, I guess. Uxkul. It's spelled – Uxkul, yeah. We'll, we'll try to find a link to something. But he's – his last name, <laughs> yeah. which is tough for Google, uh, is U-E-X-K-U-L-L. You mentioned one of his concepts. The one I liked was Umwelt, Umwelt by which, yeah. he, and I'm quoting you now. You say by which he meant the context of existence. He noted that quote, "This is uh, Uxkill. Every animal is surrounded with different things. The dog is surrounded by dog things, and the dragonfly is surrounded by dragonfly things." And this is you coming commenting. These Umwelt and our surroundings are not objective, but they comprise what the organism attends to, sees, and ignores. Hence, umwelt and vary across species, even across individual organisms within a species. And of course, I, I, I know you agree with this. People make mistakes all the time. People are flawed. They have lots of cognitive biases. We talk about them all the time on this program. But the idea yeah. that I can tell you what yours are right. is um, is arrogant. Now, I'll yeah. never forget the um, world class lawyer who told me that his uh, we couldn't have. Uh, we couldn't abolish Social Security or force retirement plans because his secretary would never be able to make those decisions for himself. This was a man <laughs> who confessed to me that he picked individual stocks and didn't have any index mutual funds. And I suggested that maybe he suffered from this. This was, an, it was a crazy idea for him. So he had right. no problem looking down on his, his secretary. I had, of course, no problem looking down on him. I might be wrong yeah. as well. But, but the idea that somehow there's this objective truth out there that, that the scientist or the expert or policymaker can know and that others cannot know seems to me a very dangerous idea. 
But yeah, I mean, this this played out actually in really interesting ways. I ran into this, uh, I don't know, just a couple months ago in, in Journal of Political Economy. Armin Alchin has this piece on sort of uncertainty and equilibrium yeah, and so forth. And um, it's a great piece. Yeah. Um, and e- Edith Penrose uh, wrote this response in e- American Economic Review. But she sort of calls out Alchin exactly on this issue, saying that, listen, uh, and, and I'm going to find the quote here real quick. She says, uh, f- for the life of me, I can't see why it is reasonable on grounds other than professional pride to endow the economists with this unreasonable <laughs> degree of omniscience and prescience and not entrepreneurs. And basically, she's saying that, you know, we, we, we're sort of looking at markets and 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 saying that there's no opportunities in, in in markets and 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 look we can we can sort of prove this through various formulas and you know and so forth through, uh, with our math but uh, uh, um, nonetheless this omniscience that we sort of give ourselves as scientists uh, why can't we just assume that there's something about these actors themselves in terms of the theories that they have she doesn't use this language I'm sort of imposing on top of it but the theories that they have uh, because you know they're trying to, in uncertain environments, make sense of the situations best they can, right? Yeah. And 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 this turns out to be important. I, I think the the, the interest, the, the part that might be really interesting to your to your listeners is that this this notion of omniscience, the way it plays out. I, I kind of like the sort of the thought experiment about sort of um, five hundred dollar bills on on um, on um, sidewalks, and so it's it's one that's used by. I don't know, Akerlof and, and Yellen and, and, and Romer and, and uh, many, many sort of economists. And, and basically the argument is that, you know, there are no $500 bills on, on sidewalks. If there uh, were, someone would have picked them up already. And it's almost the sort of the, the equivalent of this notion of natural assessment that, that Kahneman has that, that sort of the world is obvious. And in the case of economics, that things have labels on them. They have a price, right? And, 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 and so that price tells us how – how you know uh, how valuable something is, and if it's really valuable, it'll get picked up essentially. But but the argument here is that that there's no way to sort of value and label and create relevance and meaning for every single thing out there in the world essentially. So so economic actors or or sort of the Hayekian man on the spot is constantly sort of looking and finding new uses and sort of affordances for various items. That are novel and novel and new, and I think that's 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 a really sort of important point to sort of think about that omniscience and 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 how our models might need to change to sort of uh, recognize that these economic actors and agents are also sort of theoretical, uh, you know, theoretical beings in some sense, and they're trying to make sense of of the situations that they're in. Certainly, they're making mistakes, you know, that, which is inherent to you know what they're doing, what an entrepreneur is doing, but uh, but but uh, you know, giving giving them the benefit of the doubt, I guess, in some ways. So, yeah, I think another way to think about it. it- is that uh, the five hundred dollar bills are lying around are disguised? <laughs> they don't say five hundred dollar yeah. bill on them. Uh, uh, I think about about Fred Smith when he started Federal Express, and I think I mentioned this recently. You know, the first night it was open, they delivered two packages. One was a birthday present he was sending to his mom. The other was their only real <laughs> piece of business, and they were pretty discouraged. And after a few weeks or maybe months, I don't know how long it was, they realized. They weren't going to make it. Smith went to Chicago from Memphis to try to get one more loan. They turned him down. He's coming back to close the company. And if that had been the way it played out, people would have said, well, what a stupid mistake he made trying to deliver <laughs> packages overnight. It's not profitable. Didn't he realize that? And instead, he went – I think he saw on the board at the airport a flight leaving for either – I think it was Reno, somewhere in Nevada. And he got on it. And put all his money, maybe in some of his sister's money, he got sued by his sisters for raiding their family trust fund and put it all on the roulette wheel on red or whatever it was or even and happened to win and made payroll for another week or month and therefore had a chance and they started to grow and they made it. Right. And now everybody can say, well, that was a giant $5 billion, <laughs> $50 billion bill laying around, overnight delivery, and he was the only one. Mm-hmm. You know, Why did it take so – why didn't somebody pick it up earlier? And the answer is because it's not – it's not announcing. It's not beeping. So they don't beep, right? <laughs> it's just such an yeah, important point yeah. about the way innovation takes place. Yeah, yeah. I, the, the example that, that I think uh, that I like, uh, there's probably too many Steve Jobs sort of examples of everything, but I quite like this example. So when, when Steve Jobs was sort of you know uh, creating the original Macintosh, 
uh, this is captured in Walter Isaacson biography, yep. but also in several other places. When he walked into Xerox Park, so he he knew the CEO of uh, Xerox Park, I believe that it was sort of he was based in, in in New York, but he was walking through Xerox Park there in Silicon Valley, and he had a chance to sort of see this all this sort of dormant latent technology that Xerox wasn't using because they were busy, you know, with the copier business and so forth. And the way that that's sort of described, when he saw the graphic user interface and the mouse. He's, it, there's several sort of quotes on his it, there's sort of all kinds of light bulbs going off and saying, holy cow, like this is it. Like th- this, this is going to solve a major problem. And any number of other people had sort of scanned through and seen what was happening there. So Todd Zanger, who's my co-author, actually, you know, spent spent time and was at Xerox Park around the same time, walked through it. And he said, he's like, you know, no, no alarm bells, nothing went off when he is looking at this technology because he doesn't have this Suchbild or this sort of seek image, something, a problem. And, and and so in that case, they didn't have a label. It didn't say this cost $1 million or there wasn't a market for it. This wasn't being auctioned. There was nothing for it. In fact, what Steve Jobs, the arrangement that he made was it was the company was uh, – Xerox was allowed to, I think it was, invest $2 million in Apple. And then they sort of just took the technology or something like that. I can't remember what the exact you know uh, arrangement was. But, but basically, you know, things that are incredibly valuable uh, aren't – you know they aren't priced necessarily, and 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 so it's it, it's sort of the zuchbild, the questions, the problems that economic actors have that then sort of helps those light bulbs and helps create that salience, I guess, for for things that for other people might be just trash or just this is just engineers sort of messing around and this technology won't be relevant to anything, right? And 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 so it, it it's important to sort of think through the the, the zuchbild and the, and the theory that these economic actors have. So yeah. I like tying it to the first example. So Steve Jobs watching the video and he sees the gorilla and he goes, oh, my gosh, there's a gorilla among <laughs> these basketball players. He's, for him, that graf- graphical user interface was the gorilla. It was so blindingly obvious to him that that was right. something of incredible value. No one else saw right. it. And right. so what does that you know? Does that tell you they were rational? They didn't realize? No, he had a different way of saying he had a he knew what as you say he knew what question to ask, which was right. you know a question he'd been asking, and he saw this as a solution. If you weren't asking the question, it's not a solution. It's just a exactly. just a just a, a toy, something exactly. something that people had fooled around with. It was a a cool bit of achievement that you'd show off and and had no act, practical application. He saw that right. that. He had a, that it had a practical application. But the idea of seeing innovation, entrepreneurship as I, – I, I think of it as – this is a subtle point that you make. I think it's, it's, it's hard to understand it, but I, I think it's there. There's a difference between perception, certainly visual perception. Right. I, I like go back to the foraging example. Yeah. You know, I look all around. I'm very thorough. I don't see any food. I look all around. But if I don't realize right. I can go over the hill – Right. Or if I don't realize I can climb up the tree and not just look right. at the base of the tree, yeah. uh, I'm missing. And so the person right. who comes along and has that innovative insight uh, is able to see, perceive in a richer, different way. But you wouldn't want yeah. to call the first person blind. They right. see everything. They got everything. Yeah. So I think it's the whole idea that perception uh, sort of what's in your field of vision is not really the interesting question. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I and I guess that that's part of the concern I have is that there's sort of this discounting of people's beliefs and other types of things. And I, I, the psychology that we've introduced is for 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 my taste really one sided. And so if you look at original, if you look at the work of people like William James and others, it's it's a far richer conceptions of of, of human beings. And 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 it's it you know human beings are driven by their beliefs, for example. And so you have beliefs that uh, uh, that will then lead you to see certain things. And and this for me ties into people like Adam Smith. And so uh, a book that I quite like is, you know, along with the original work, obviously, of, uh, of Adam Smith is, is, is Emma, Emma Rothschilds, who's an economic historian at Harvard, uh, has this book called Economic Sentiments. But in it, she sort of quotes Adam Smith as wanting to get into the, into the sentiments and minds of the actors. And then she has this sort of summary that I like. It's not Smith saying, but it's, it's her summary of what Adam Smith was a- after, which is that Adam Smith was after a theory of people with theories. And I thought that was just beautiful. It's just a beautiful sort of conception. Explain of that. Of, 
Yeah, so it's 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 a conception of, of of human nature that gives them the same sort of proclivities that you know we as sort of scientists have about them, and so rather than sort of observing human beings as automaton, you know, on some kind of chessboard or or, or whatever that we can manipulate and move in certain ways, rather we give some dignity to those actors, recognize that they're you know acting under in, in uncertain conditions, but these people also have have theories that guide and models that guide their activity. Uh, that then lead to hopefully great things like iPhones and 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 and, and uh, uh, you know uh, cars and you know and so forth, and and I think that that conception is missing. I mean, there's a little bit of it in economics, and Edith Penrose had a little bit of that intuition. Uh, recently, I visited with um, Eric Vandenstein, who's an economist at Harvard, and, and and he's talked about sort of beliefs and managerial vision, and I and I kind of like that notion as well. And and with a co- uh, uh, co-author Todd Zanger, we've tried to sort of flesh that out into uh, into a theory of thinking about you know the role of economic actors, sort of having these theories about how to create value rather than starting with the premise that they're sort of blinded and so forth and and, and mistake ridden, which they are. But 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 can we also sort of uh, uh, develop I guess uh, a model that gives them the same capacities that we have as well? So yeah. I- this has – obviously, you mentioned earlier the, the relevance for you know, behavioral economics. Uh, one criticism that some have made of behavioral economics is it's just criticism. It doesn't uh, – it just says, well, economics, you know, the reductio ad absurdum of, of homo economicus is rational, is all-knowing, um, perfectly informed, um, perfectly rational calculating machine of maximizing utility – is quote inaccurate, which of course it is. No, no thoughtful person would, would disagree with that. But uh-huh. what the behavioral economics and psychology literature have done to some extent is just accumulate uh, shortcomings of that model. But as you point out, you know, it doesn't tell us how people actually behave. It doesn't, so far at least, as far as I understand. Maybe I'm being unfair to it. I don't know. Um, but you're <laughs> suggesting that that we should get into the Smith's style. Adam Smith style, and try to figure out what theories people are using to understand the world imperfectly, of course, because they have yep. they can't. There's no such thing as a perfect understanding. I think it's one of the lessons of, of what you've written. Yeah. Um, and to think more deeply about that, or maybe it's not possible. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, that's the problem is that any sort of beliefs, particularly if it's radical beliefs about something, they, they can look like delusion, you know, to, to yeah. other people. And so the, the example I like, so I actually, before I got a PhD, I worked in venture capital and, and we, were, we were trying to invest in, you know, things that are the next big thing, right? And, and, and the next, you know, people sort of pitching the next big thing tend to go, sort of go in herds. And, <laughs> and there was a lot of sort of similarity around what they were pitching rather than sort of truly novel beliefs about things. But, but, but a window into this actually that, 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 uh, uh, I, uh, that I think is quite interesting. Uh, um, one of the, um, uh, I don't remember the venture capitalist name right now. One of the venture capitalists who invested in sort of Instagram and 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 then Twitter and many sort of very successful companies. There's this interesting exchange where they had a chance to invest in uh, Airbnb, and uh, uh, the, in this real time sort of exchange when they were talking about whether we should invest in this company, um, they uh, talked about they're like, well, we're not sure that this sort of couch surfing thing is really going to blow up and become a big, you know, hotel chain or anything like that. There's no way that you can compete with a sophisticated sort of hotel market. And it sort of goes against the intuition that we'd want to sort of have sort of, you know, people that we don't know stay in our homes. Like, why would you want to rent out your home? And why, if, when you go to New York, why on earth, if there's a sophisticated hotel market, why would you stay in somebody's place rather than in a hotel? And so, so there's this intuition where it's sort of counterintuitive and contradictory to sort of common sense almost, right? Yeah. And, 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 and so you can actually find this email exchange that sort of captures some of this, not exactly in those words, but it highlights this, this, this issue, which is the, you know, the beliefs that entrepreneurs might have 
on the whole, looking at funders, you know, funders and the public might say, you know, this is nuts. Like I wouldn't put my house up for anybody to use, uh, but they sort of stuck with it and they said, no, we think this is a thing now. And, and it turns out that now it is the biggest. It has the most rooms in the world. It's bigger than Marriott and you know any number of other chains. And and they sort of have this what looked like a delusional belief that they sort of once they solved certain problems like you know uh, uh, you know verification of people's identities and 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 sort of using an eBay type sort of both recommendation and kind of reputation system that that, that made you feel comfortable renting to somebody you've never even met. Uh, they they solved all those problems and then it became something, right? And I think Uber is sort of a similar thing as well. I mean, we're all told you shouldn't ride with sta- strangers and so <laughs> forth, but 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 they they solved a host of problems, held on to this sort of theory and belief that this this could be something. And so now when I travel, it's a, sort of a mess with my kids and. And, and getting you know a number of hotel rooms doesn't work, and so we always just use Airbnb because it's a very simple solution. Uh, uh, but had I sort of been asked about that to invest in it at the time, I probably would have said the same things as some of these venture capitalists, which is no, you know what, couch surfing like this is fine for hippies and whatever, but this won't be a this won't be a mainstream you know value creating activity that deserves venture venture investment. And so so I, I do think that yeah, getting into the theories and models that people have and, and sort of thinking through. Who do they need to convince? You know what funding mechanisms? Public markets aren't always very good at sort of funding things that are counterintuitive, and so maybe you have to find certain more patient investors or you know people who buy into the theory and the model that will then enable you to actually realize realize it in a in a way uh, that others don't think is possible. Essentially, yeah. I encourage listeners to check out. Um the episode we did with uh, Nathan Butchartrick of uh, one of the co-founders of Airbnb and also Sam Altman, who uh, describes how – I think it was Sam uh, – described how uh, they were accepted into uh, the Y Combinator to get help and funding even though they – it was a ridiculous idea. But they thought a lot about – that the founders were really creative and that revolves around cereal boxes. You can You can listen to that as well as – Mark Andreessen, I think, talks about why he passed on Google, uh, uh, a mis- quote, mistake, uh, <laughs> or I don't know what you want to call it. I wouldn't call it a mistake, but a decision he made that he wishes had been made otherwise, obviously. What's interesting to me is that you know, a lot of those, as you say, a lot of those startups seemed implausible. Um, it's certainly Airbnb is ridiculous. They, they that I'd let strangers in my house and, or stay at a stranger's house. And Obviously, there's two kinds of rentals for Airbnb. You get the whole house, but a lot of times you're taking a room in someone's house. That that right. would work is crazy, uh, right. but it does. And so in the early days of that kind of venture capital, people were just so skeptical of many of those ideas. Now I think they've gone the other way. It's like, well, they'll figure it out. Yeah, it'll work. <laughs> like, so the driverless car is thought to be um, inevitable. Uh, and I have to concede. I sort of think it is inevitable, but it has a lot of challenges, um, right. and it's not obvious. You know, if you had to bet on when it's going to be the dominant form of transportation, that's not a bet I'm happy about eager right. to make. I have no idea. I see all the selling points, and I have assumed foolishly that all the technical challenges have been solved, all the regulatory <laughs> barriers have been solved. We're going to put three to five bil- million people out of work in America driving taxis, Ubers, and and trucks eagerly to avoid killing people dying in accidents. We assume that no one will die in an accident, or maybe a handful of people, if they're driverless cars. So all these problems are going to get solved somehow. It's just inevitable. And, and sure. certainly, enormously... Large bets are being made that it will happen by more than one company, which is crazy. Right, right. right. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to say something about heuristics because heuristics, which are you know, rules of thumb that people use to make decisions and to get through life, are an example of something that I think is often called irrational or foolish. And uh, I think it's an example of where the omniscience of the outsider is uh, making a mistake. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, there's there's sort of a debate between the biases, uh, liter- folks who focus on biases, so Kahneman, Torsky, and, and and others, and then there's a there's a sort of strain of research in psychology by Gigerenzer and, and and many of his colleagues that focuses on heuristics, which say that, you know, these things that look like biases are are are, are roughly 
uh, uh, rational. So, so, the, so the all-seeing eye article that you talked about it actually led to a debate where Giger ends their sort of response to some things and so forth. I, I have some challenges with th- that notion of heuristics because the, the emphasis that they have is on sort of very general heuristics, and I'm, I'm much more focused on sort of very specific heuristics almost as questions. And so for me, a simple heuristic, and this comes from Michael Paul and I, is is sort of this Suchbild friendly way of thinking about it, which is, you know, searching for an object is for me a heuristic. And so when you have something in mind uh, that you're looking for, like you're looking for a solution to make computing, personal computing easy. And so if that's that's your sort of model, then you're going to quickly identify graphic user interface and mouse versus if you're IBM and you're saying, you know, personal computing is never really going to be a thing. It's going to be these big mainframes and so forth. You're not even looking at the world in the same way. And so the, the heuristic is this sort of search for given sort of a certain model of the world that then guides your activi- guides your activities. And so so that's why I like the notion of Zuchbild, which you, you can sort of translate into a, some kind of heuristic or seek search image where you're trying to wrestle with a problem that then lets you quickly see something that others others aren't seeing. And again, if our emphasis is that the, that the world tells us what's obvious, then we'll never get to those things. And, and, and so it's, it's, the, it's the sort of difference in, you know, me coming to a painting and crying because it has some meaning to me or it answers some question or whatever versus somebody else sort of just walking by and saying like, whatever, you know, I don't, I, all I see is uh, 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 yeah, a bunch of color or landscape or Shapes. what have you. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and so it's, it's rather than sort of focusing on uh, or thinking that the world is going to give us this relevance and meaning, we need to impose that with the questions that we have. And I think that goes for the arts just as it goes for sort of entrepreneurship or any any other activity because it, it, it sort of guides our uh, pa- behaviors in powerful ways and leads us to, like I said, you know, novel, interesting, creative innovation and, and, and so forth. So, Wouldn't you say, though, that so many of the most important innovations of the last 50 to 100 years – are people who didn't look for something that would solve that problem. I mean, so often, I mean, it's part of it's a question of semantics about what you mean by look for and what you mean by right. something that would solve the problem. But it, it strikes sure. me that you know, one of my favorite examples of this is, um, is the slide rule. So the slide rule is this fantastically amazing human creation, which many of our listeners, uh, by the way, I mentioned in a recent episode that about that a lot of our listeners are 25 to 34. I, they're not more than half. They're the largest group. Um, they're about 36% in the survey that we did. Uh, they're more than, the, than say, the uh, 36 to 45. But I don't um, – we have a lot of young listeners, all it means, not, not that they're the dominant. But those young listeners, uh, and even the ones under 44, uh, which are also a fairly large group, uh, they uh, have never seen a slide rule. They probably don't – you probably don't know what they what one is, and it was a, a computing device. It was a way to make pretty accurate, not perfectly accurate, but pretty accurate calculations of various kinds, trigonometry, um, large multiple-digit uh, math problems that, right. that until about, what, 1970 or so had to be solved with either a book that you looked up in the back of, with a bunch of tables, and my dad had such a book, he'd – I don't know why he had it. It wasn't a STEM kind of guy, but he had that book. Uh, I think it's because he was a psych uh, uh, grad student and had done some statistics in his time. So you had to use that book or you had to use a slide roll. And every engineer <laughs> had a slide roll in their pocket or in their – somewhere in their briefcase. And then the – so what destroy – and the biggest slide roll company was Kaifel and Esser, k and E. I I think they were the largest. And you'd think, well, how do you make a better slide roll? We'll make it out of more durable equipment. We'll make the marks <laughs> finer so you can make the calculations. Right. Right. But what kills it is the pocket calculator, of course, which not only is ends up being cheaper than – more accurate than the slide roll, ends up ultimately being much less expensive, which is really mind-blowing. Um, and that can, comes out of nowhere, right? It's, it's, it's the kind of innovation that, dis, that disrupts an industry – uh, because they just can't imagine – they can imagine, they didn't know where to look for it. Uh, so I would think that's an important part of the story. It's a different kind of looking, at least it seems to me. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's something intriguing about sort of the nexus of kind of these questions that organisms or people or entrepreneurs have and then serendipity. I, I think of the story of Archimedes. And so Archimedes is given this challenge by, was it the king or I can't remember, uh, to sort of uh, ask about sort of how do I measure the volume of a re- an irregular shape, essentially. I think it was a crown or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was a crown. And he says, yeah, no, this is this is impossible. And and so he goes home and he lowers himself into a bathtub and he notices that the bathtub in sort of commensurate fashion, sort of the water raises and he says, you know, holy cow, Eureka, he runs out onto the streets of Syracuse naked and, <laughs> and says, and, and so it's, it's sort of where, so is that serendipity or is it sort of this question that's been posed to somebody who's smart, who has a theory and then observes and says, wait a second, this is this is different because any all of us have lowered ourselves into bathtubs, but we might sort of not sort of associate that with that question per se. Right. And, and, and so I think that there's an important sort of role in the questions that we pose. And when those meet certain observations out there in the world, then we come out with insights. And so just to give sort of another example, so Newton observed, he actually told this story to a friend and it was sort of captured. Uh, uh, he said, he said, you know, he observed the apple falling and any number of people have observed things falling. Right. But, but, but we don't have sort of a theory of gravitation that immediately sort of pops to mind. It, it's, it's with the right question and theory that things start to take on new meaning and relevance in the same way. He didn't have big data to, to sort of highlight how white light, you know, actually is sort of composed of, you know, uh, uh, the rainbow and he'd observed rainbows just like any number of other people had observed rainbows, but it was sort of with the question and the interpretation that these sort of observations then took on new meaning. And so no big data would really tell you anything about that, right? So you could run, you know, big data and observations. And and in some ways we had, all of us had seen things falling or in throughout, you know, history, things had fallen or we'd seen rainbows, but it's only once we have the right question and problem to solve that these things take on meaning and become quite powerful. But absolutely, there's some form of, you know, serendipity in sort of the question meeting, meeting this encounter with the graphic user interface or the Apple or the rainbow or what have you, that then creates tremendous insight about, you know, what, what, what might be, what might be possible. So. Well, I also want to suggest, and we'll close on this. I also think there's something Mysterious, something uh, it doesn't not necessarily mystical, but it might end up being mystical. But something mysterious about innovation and and insight and perception. So you mentioned Archimedes. That you said any number of people lowered themselves in a bath before. Well, so had Archimedes. So if you <laughs> asked why this time, he couldn't have answered that question. And right. part of it he could have because he said, "Well, I'm thinking about the crown," but he could have understood. Most of us can't understand how we come to that insight at that moment. My son's um, one of my sons is reading uh, Oliver Sacks' book, An Anthropologist on Mars. Um, no, excuse me, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Both are great books. Right. Yeah. And The Man Who Mistook for his, his Wife for a Hat, they're two autistic, uh, I think they're sisters, it's twins. And Sacks spills a box of matches on the floor. And um, there's a, they both say immediately, the two of them together, that, oh, there's 117 matches on the floor. And then they both say 39. And 39 is a third of, of um, 117. And the incredible thing is they can't multiply 39 times 3. If you'd given that problem, they couldn't solve it. But they can see in some fashion we don't understand. And so I think the tendency to map the human brain as a computer and to assume that all problems will be solved by computers because computation will be better presumes that all problems are computational. And I think many problems – are not computational. You know, my favorite example of this is Andrew of Eureka. My, you know, you, Archimedes is pretty good, but Andrew Wiles, who solves Fermi's Last Theorem, and then is on the front page of the New York Times for his insight, and then discovers there's a mistake in it. It spends over, I think, over a little over a year trying to reprove of something that he assumes is true, <laughs> and then one day just says he sees it. And he can't explain how he saw it. It's not like he, you know, he worked on it in a different way or his brain, he just tried harder. Something just clicked. And some part of the human experience is that clicking that we don't understand. Maybe we'll come to understand it someday. It's possible, but I, I don't know. Yeah. 
I, I think just the comfort with sort of uncertainty and that type of serendipity and so forth, I think is in, in, important. And, and I guess, you know, with a lot of science, we have all kinds of certainty and about what's obvious and so forth. And, and I think over time, the people that are comfortable sort of sitting back and maybe questioning some of those foundations that might then yield interesting insights that are, you know, just fundamentally different. Uh, my, 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 uh, I've been working with this co-author, Stuart Kaufman, who he's himself an atheist, but he wrote a book called Reinventing the Sacred. And he said, essentially, what we've done with science is we've sort of taken out the mystery <laughs> in terms of being comfortable with sort of uncertainty and, and emergent and other types of dynamics. And I think that this issue of perception highlights that. And I think we can get in, get, get, a, get a window into some of this by thinking about the Zulu builds that we have in terms of where we look for meaning and where we look for insight and and what types of problems we're trying to solve and and that's that's sort of part of the essay and and this this uh, 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 these pieces with Jan and, and and Joachim to try to sort of uh, 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 develop those arguments so my guest today has been Tepo Feline Tepo thanks for being part of econ talk thanks so much This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.